Thank you. Uh, why don't you just keep reading from the reviews? I'll just, I'll just go get lunch. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I can't quite get Tony Horowitz out of the air here, uh, so I'm going to begin with one last little tribute to Tony. If you weren't here for the Tony Horowitz tribute, It's coming. There you go. How about now? OK. Um, I mentioned at the outset of the previous session, and I hope this is a segue to Mr. D, um, that Tony came and spent a day with Jim Horton and me when we were at Harper's Ferry teaching all these National Park Service people. And he did then go back and write a piece in The New Yorker in the Week in Review. Um, he observed in that piece uh, what he called a two-day crash course on slavery and abolition, which is what we were doing. He called us coaches for those on the front lines of, national con of the national conversation on race and how to handle the ignorance and discomfort they, the Park Service historians, so often encounter in their audiences. He related stories we used to try to equip those public historians, to humanize this difficult part of our past. And then he quoted my old friend Jim Horton, saying, if you're American, you have rights to all the things we're proud of. That's part of your heritage. But you have to inherit the bad things, too. And there's a debt that comes with that inheritance, which we're still trying to repay. There's, there's a way in which a lot of Tony's work was part of that repaying. OK. A biography on Douglas. How do you organize and make sense of a life, an epic life, that traversed most of the 19th century? I want to first very briefly say why I even did this book. I may have mentioned this yesterday at the panel, but I would not have written this biography were it not for a private collection that I encountered by great good luck 12 years ago in Savannah, Georgia, which may seem an odd place for there to be a big collection of Frederick Douglass material, but hey, evidence and documents come from anywhere. I went to Savannah to give a talk on Frederick Douglass's narrative, his first autobiography, to middle school and high school teachers, which I've done many, many times. And when I arrived, my host at the Georgia Historical Society said, there's a local gentleman here who's a collector. He'd like to meet you and have lunch. And I must have said something like, oh, OK. And that day, I met Walter Evans. Uh, and all, all tribute, all honor to Walter and his wife, Linda. And if you pick up the book or if you've read it, you may have noted the book is dedicated to them. That day, I went over to Walter's house, and I saw at least the beginnings of or portions of his Frederick Douglass collection, which he had been buying and collecting for uh, oh, ever since about 1980. I was not the first person ever to see it, but I was the first to use it. Walter is an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, came north for his higher ed. He went to Howard University in DC. Then he went to the University of Michigan Medical School. And he practiced in Detroit, uh, where I'm from, or I'm actually from Flint, just north of there, for some 35 years as a, as a general surgeon. But his real passion in life was collecting African-American rare books, manuscripts, and art. His art collection is, if anything, far more important than his manuscript collection. He's, he's one of, he has one of the greatest private collections of African-American art anywhere in the world. To make a long story short, I spent, I don't know, four, five, six spring breaks from Yale staying in Savannah, working in the greatest archive I've ever been in, which is Walter and Linda's dining room table. It doesn't get much better. <laughs> 
uh, in his house, which is a big four or five story brownstone in Savannah. Uh, the house is literally chocked full of rare books all over the place, manuscript boxes. He, has our, he knows what he's doing. Everything's in archive boxes. <laughs> in the TV room, in the parlor, everywhere, even in the kitchen. There are archive boxes. And I spent a lot of other weeks there as well. The core of that collection, and again, the reason I did this book, are about 10 very large Douglas family scrapbooks that were kept by, largely by two of Douglas's sons over the last 30 to 35 years of their father's life. And what that collection holds are windows, revealing windows, into the last third of Douglas's life, such as we have never had before. Douglas lived to be 77 years old. He was born in 1818 out in a backwater of the eastern shore of Maryland, along a horseshoe bend in the Tuckahoe River. He was a nobody from nowhere. But he's going to live to 1895. He's going to be born before steamboats are on American rivers, before the railroad, before the telegraph, before the rotary press, which will revolutionize his life. He'll make a career because of that rotary press as a great journalist, a great newspaper editor. And, and, and now the possibilities of rapid expansion of information. But he's going to live all the way to the 1890s in a whole new kind of modernity. Steamships that can cross the Atlantic in eight days. The first electric light, electric light bulbs, first internal combustion engines, all kinds of things. And he was really into gadgets and modernity, or their version of modernity. Uh, he lived, even lived long enough for the phonograph, although so far as we know, still, there's no evidence that he was ever recorded, which is a shame. He's probably the greatest oratorical voice of the 19th century. We don't have a recording of him, and I don't think he ever was recorded. I have reason to believe that. Anyway, that last third of Douglas's life, though, is the part of his life we've never known as much about, or for that matter, even cared as much about. The Frederick Douglass people now may know, or perhaps grow up learning something about, because they read the narrative in junior high or high school. They read it in college. It's taught all over the world now. It's in many editions. We know the Douglas may be uh, of the great orator of the 1840s and 50s leading up to the Civil War. Many people across the country now read Frederick Douglass's Fourth of July speech on the Fourth of July or the Fifth, which is the date he gave it. It's the rhetorical masterpiece of American abolitionism and one, one of the rhetorical masterpieces of American literature. And maybe, maybe people know something about Douglas. Here, I think. How about now? This is my last event of the day, so I'll just start shouting. I can. Um, you know, people may know he met Lincoln three times. They may know about that activist in the midst of the Civil War. They may even know that he recruited black soldiers in the Civil War. But that last third of his life, when he becomes the old radical who lives to see the triumph of his cause in the middle of his life, he's only in his 40s at the time of the victory of the Civil War and emancipation of four million slaves, he's going to live 30 more years to reap that victory to try to preserve that victory and become a political insider. He's the old radical outsider who becomes a political insider. That on the surface always seems less interesting. To me it became, it took over the book. The aging Douglas, the patriarch of a huge extended family, four surviving adult children, 21 grandchildren, at least three fictive kin who adopted him or he adopted them, and always a variety of other hangers on, always gathering around Douglas because they thought he had a lot of money. A patriarch of a huge extended family that was in many ways, in many modern ways, quite dysfunctional. Maybe we can come back to that. that, that, that that's a loaded term and that's a teaser. 
But that aging Douglas is a fascinating phenomenon. Maybe I got fascinated by, by it because I'm aging so much, but why not? So all honor to Walter because his, his collection uh, made possible. I had no intention of writing a full life of Douglas. I did my first book on Douglas, which was a dissertation, way back in 18, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, 1889. That was when. Uh, uh, occupational hell. You work on the 19th century, you're always in the 19th century. Um, they had a lot of problems in the 19th century, too. So. Um, I had edited editions of his autobiography. I'd written essays on him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I had Douglas finally out of my life until I met Walter. And when I got this Pulitzer thing, uh, Walter came to New York. He was there with me. I shared it with him. Uh, why not? Um, and now he wants a part in the movie, so <laughs> who knows if, if a movie ever gets made. Um, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna tell you a little bit more about the book and I'll do that with some speed, but I also wanna put you somewhere that might be useful to us at this actual moment, this political moment. And I'm just, not just referring to the violence we just experienced today and yesterday, although that too. But Douglas gave, well, thousands of speeches, uh, many of them masterpieces. Uh, and by the way, every major Douglas speech exists in a text. He wrote his speeches. This man was a writer above all else. There was nothing he was more proud of than that he had become a, the former slave with no education, the nobody from nowhere who became a world-class writer, the most important African-American of letters in the 19th century. They all exist in text. Now, he wasn't just that orator who could go into a hall or a room and just blow out the lights off the top of his head. He could do that too, if you wanted him to. But he had text. And he, his, possibly his most optimistic, hopeful, almost utopian speech was a speech he gave, he first wrote in 1867. He's giving it throughout the late 1860s. Note the dates. This is Reconstruction, the beginning of Reconstruction, the really hopeful short phase of Reconstruction if you're a partisan to the radical Reconstruction cause of extending civil and political rights to the free people and remaking the U.S. Constitution in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The speech was called the Composite Nation. This is 150 years ago. In fact, the text we have of it comes from 1869, 150 years ago this summer. In Composite Nation, Douglas argues that because of this Armageddon, the United States has just survived. This massive slaughter of 700,000 people in this war that nevertheless has led to the emancipation of four million slaves and the remaking of the United States, rooted in 13th. And now, when he first writes this, it's right after the passage of the 14th Amendment, and he really is giving it on the road uh, widely in, in 1869, right after the passage of the 15th Amendment, which is the Voting Rights Amendment, Douglas says in this speech, this new United States, this reinvented United States, the second American Republic, now has the chance to be something the world had never seen. A multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious republic, all from, with peoples from all corners of the world who were all living under equality before law and the rule of law. He says, imagine. The world's always dreamed of this. You know, the natural rights tradition is as old as the epistles of Paul, and then through the philosophes of the Enlightenment, and so on and so on. He says, look, the world's always dreamed of this idea. We have a chance to do it. Not only that, Douglas at this moment, uh, not unlike a whole bunch of other former abolitionists, although not all of them, they had a lot of fights over this, has even become overnight an expansionist. He's become what today we might call a kind of soft imperialist. He believes this, this United States that he has spent his life uh, attacking for its hypocrisy, 
It's racism. It's slavery. It's pro-slavery ideology. He says, this United States now is the abolitionist United States. And the United States ought to take its new ideology, ought to take its new uh, anti-slavery ideology out to the world. Spread it to the Caribbean. Take it to Santo Domingo. Take it to Haiti. Take it even further. He's an expansionist overnight. And this is the same Douglas who, when he came back, I mean, there are so many examples of this, but for, for one example, when he came back from England, his first great sojourn to England in 1845 to 47, spends 18, 19 months in England, flowering of his life as an orator and a thinker and even as a man. Just before he came back to the United States, he was wary of even coming back. He said he had no sense of home or country. This is 1847. He says, I, quote, have no love for America as such. I have no patriotism. I have no country. The institutions of this country do not know me, do not recognize me as a man, he declared, except as a piece of property. He said the only thing that drew him back to America at that point was his family and what he called his deeply felt ties to the three millions of my fellow creatures groaning beneath the iron rod with stripes upon their backs. And then he said, I desire to see, he said, the Constitution of the United States is so flawed that I dese desire to see it overthrown as speedily as possible, and that Constitution shivered in a thousand fragments. That was Douglas of the 1840s and well into the 1850s, although he's going to, as many of you know, warm up to politics and political parties and political action in the 1850s and, and even to a, an anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution. Okay. But that same Douglas, in the wake of the Civil War, the transformations, the possible transformations of that event, says, we're the composite nation, or we could become one. In the middle of this speech, the whole middle section of it, he makes a forthright argument for Chinese immigration, which was just then becoming a very big political issue, especially from California, and especially about the labor used in the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, the first Chinese Exclusion Act won't come until 1875. That'll be against Chinese women. And then the final complete Chinese uh, Restriction Act came in 1882 when Chinese immigration was just cut off till way into the 20th century. In fact, cut off for almost 100 years. And he makes a case. He says, look, the Chinese are about as different as anyone we can think of from these Americans. These, and Douglas considered himself a kind, he was obviously a black American and proud of it, but he was very much an Anglophile. He saw the traditions of the United States obviously drawn from Britain and so on and so on and so on. That's how he'd learned his Americanism. He says, look, the Chinese are about as different as, as you know, they're pagans, they're not Christians, they're never going to probably make good Christians. They speak a language none of us know, but they're industrious. They work. What are you afraid of? That's 1869. <laughs> and by the way, <laughs> even that argument about advocating Chinese immigration, he's still a 19th century man. It's full of, he plays on some other ethnic stereotypes as he's making the argument. He says, yeah, you know, the French come here. We don't mind them. <laughs> he says, you know, it's probably because half of them go back because they always got their eye on Paris, he says. And then he had, I don't know if this was anti-Semitic or not, but he says, you know, and they've always got their hands in our pockets. So what's your problem? You like the French. And then he goes into some German stereotypes. He says, oh, the Germans. We love the Germans, don't we? Because we love their music. And then he has this line where he says, and the Germans are always so happy. <laughs> I thought, what, German, what, what Germans has he met? You know? <laughs> well, they weren't the 20th century Germans, but. And then he plays on the Irish and even black stereotypes. He says, look, we got a lot of Irishmen here, and we like their labor and their strong arms. And the Negro, we like his labor. We've always used his labor, haven't we? I mean, never paid him. We love labor. So what's wrong with Chinese labor? 
And he says, stop worrying about the yellow peril. So it's such a prescient, modern kind of speech, almost out of its place, the dream. And it reads at times almost like a 1998, you know, multiculturalism manifesto for a school curriculum, you know, or the diversity manifesto for any university now. It's multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and we're all going to get along. That's 1869. I cannot find any evidence that he ever gave that speech again after about 71 or 72. Reconstruction is having his heyday when he, when he constructs this vision. By the early to mid 1870s, the attack, the counter revolution against Reconstruction, and you can learn a great deal about that from Skip Gates's book, as you know, who's sitting right over here, and the film, the four part film on Reconstruction. Yeah. You can't just show up like that without me doing that. Uh, anyway, but as the counter revolution begins to start happening against Reconstruction, and after the panic of 1873, the economic panic of 73, which really changed the political landscape, he's never going to give this speech again. It doesn't mean he doesn't believe in it. It just doesn't seem to fit anymore. It shows us, if nothing else, the amazing power or possibility of that historical moment of roughly 1865 to 1870, the remaking of a second American republic, and here we still are 150 years later. Are we a composite nation? Of course we are, most places. Walk through any American city. Some of our cities are so composite, you don't know what language is going on. Somebody said yesterday, Queens has 200 languages. Good God, you know. That, it, pull it up, all, almost all of Douglass's major speeches are now online. Pull that speech up and ask yourself, what year is this? All right, quickly. <clears throat> this book, I organized, uh, how do you organize a life that is so long and so epic? Uh, that's what biography is in a way. You're always selecting, that's what history is. You're selecting, you're putting in, you're throwing out. What do you leave in, what do you leave out? You never have enough on this little subject, so you skirt around it. You have too much on this subject and you wear it out and your editor tells you, cut it back. But how do you organize such a life? I organized it around six basic themes. I've already told you one of them. But the first theme, and the theme that drives the book, I hope, and I think it has to on this man, is words. This came up yesterday in our panel. Douglas is about his words. We wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be talking about him, if it weren't for the millions of words that he wrote. As I said earlier, he was a writer. He wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography three of them, and then he revised the third one a fourth time. And if you're a biographer of this man, never trust anybody who writes three autobiographies. <laughs> he's always there right in front of you. He's in the way. He's guiding you in every way possible, and there's a whole lot he's not telling you. Uh, but words. And how did he get this facility with words? How did he master language the way he did? There's some mystery to that, just like there's, there's always mystery about every great writer, right? I mean, how do we really understand how Whitman became Whitman? Is there a perfect explanation of that? How do we know how Du Bois became Du Bois? Well, we know a lot about Du Bois' education. Douglas had no education, except in, in reading, and in newspapers, and in listening, and hearing oratory, especially the sermonic tradition in churches. Douglas grew up in slavery as a slave, learning language first and foremost through the King James Version of the Bible. Douglas got language planted in his head in the cadences of the King James. He names four different churches in Baltimore 
He lived nine of his 20 years as a slave in Maryland in the city of Baltimore. And without Baltimore, we wouldn't even know about him. Without Baltimore, he doesn't escape. Without Baltimore, he doesn't see visions of the world. Without Baltimore, he wouldn't have had that imagination of maritime Baltimore. Without Baltimore, he wouldn't have met Anna Murray, who helped him escape, and a few other people who helped him. But he names these four ministers, two white and two black, what he liked and didn't like about all of them. He probably first heard the Exodus story being preached about in Baltimore churches. And then he met an old black minister, a guy named Charles Lawson, that he called Father Lawson, sometimes he called him Uncle Lawson. And old Lawson was a, was a drayman by day, drove a cart to try to make some money, but he was a Bible fanatic. And he would, and, when, and once he met this kid, this 12, 13, 14 year old kid, he sat him down and he had Douglas reading the Bible out loud with him because Lawson was not a very good reader. So there was, there was Douglas. For hours and hours, he said, sitting there just reading the stories of the Old Testament, which no doubt he didn't understand. Do you understand all the stories of the Old Testament? I mean, who can? But he, that's where he got language in his head. That's where he got storytelling in his head. And before he even left slavery, he was running a group of his, he called them his band of brothers on the Freeland farm when he's 18 years, 17 and 18 years old. Uh, he would take them out on Sundays in a brush arbor and he'd practice oratory with them and he'd read to them and he'd preach at them because he was the only one who was literate. What Douglas discovered before he even left slavery, that the one kind of thing he was good at and the only kind of power he had was the power of words. So words all throughout is a big theme. The second theme, and I've already mentioned it, so I'll run right by it, are the autobiographies. Because the autobiographies in Douglas's case are both your source and your subject. They're a tremendous source of a lot of the details, especially of his early life, and even of his later life. The last autobiography is a lot of kind of an old man summing up a great life and name dropping all the famous people he'd met. But he's got a lot of stories to tell about him, and that's good. It's not as good a piece of writing as the first two. Remember, he writes two autobiographies before emancipation. He writes that third one when he's the grand old man representing emancipation. It's a whole different kind of text. But they're the problem, too, because there's almost nothing about his private life. There's one mention of his wife, Anna, of 44 years and 1,200 pages of autobiography, and she's called My Wife. There's almost nothing about his four adult children, very, very little. He was quite proud of them in some ways, but they had a lot of terrible struggles in other ways. He does not go there. Now, that's not uncommon. Nobody wrote all tell-all autobiographies in the 19th century. But the autobiographies weave throughout the book both as a, as a source, but also as a subject. Why does he keep writing his own life? You have to explain that. Why does this man keep telling his own story over and over and over and over? I mean, a lot of people just conclude about that and say, oh, because he was the representative of black America and he had to. Yeah, but maybe he was also always searching for himself. Who am I? How did I get from that side of the Chesapeake Bay to this side? How did I get from that bend in the Tuckahoe in my grandma Betsy's cabin to the White House? advising Mr. Lincoln in 1864. How did I get from the Eastern Shore to the greatest halls of Edinburgh and, and everywhere else in England? How am I who I am? I think that's what drove him to keep writing it. Who the hell am I? And he never did figure out who his father was, though he really tried. The third big thing of the theme of the book, and I've already mentioned this, so I'll do it quickly, is the Bible itself. Uh, I'm not the first Douglas scholar to emphasize his biblical grounding, but most have never gone there. Part of that has to do with the secular academy and our disinterest in or our discomfort with things biblical. Douglas could not write a speech, for that matter, sometimes even a short-form editorial, which he mastered, 
without some kind of biblical passage, some kind of biblical storytelling in it, a metaphor. It is all over his work. And I had to struggle with this because I didn't have any formal theological training. I've always been fascinated with religion as a force in history. But I, I'll be quick with this, but I, had, I have some theologian friends who really helped me. Uh, one in particular is a rabbi in New Haven, Connecticut, Jim Ponet, who used to be head rabbi at Yale University. And he used to sit in the front row. He, got, he retired, and he used to sit in the front row with his wife, Alana, at my lecture course. And they'd hang around, and we'd go to lunch, and we'd talk. And Jim learned about my dilemmas with Douglas's biblical grounding, and he said, all right, David, sit down. Read this, read that, read Robert Alter. But for God's sake, read Abraham Heschel. And he even gave me his own copy of Heschel's The Prophets. I went and got my own. But among the things, and I quote Heschel probably four times in the book, in that great work called The Prophets, where in the first chapter Heschel spends about 60 pages defining what a prophet is, which is what I needed. I needed help because I kept wanting to use the word prophet. In, in the title of this book, and I thought, man, that's bold. You put that in your title, you've got to defend it. Heschel, just one passage. The prophet is human, said Heschel. Yet he employs notes one octave too high for our ears. He experiences moments that defy our understanding. He is neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet but an assaulter of the mind. Often, his words begin to burn where our conscience ends. An assaulter of the mind. Prophets are not nice. They're probably not even fun to have lunch with. And they're not supposed to be. They're supposed to trouble us. They're supposed to make us hurt. They're supposed to take us down paths we do not want to go down. They, they're there to remind us of things that we've lost. And the more I read Heschel, the more I read his definitions, and his template, of course, was the Hebrew prophets. But the more I read him, I thought, yeah, that's Douglas. Mm-hmm, that's Douglas. Mm-hmm, that's Douglas. That ability with words to capture the meaning of a historical moment, a pivot in history, a crisis, a problem, to find the language for something the rest of us can't. That's Douglas. All right, lastly, I've already named the fourth big theme, and that is what happens to the radical outsider who becomes the political insider? I weave that through the book a great deal, especially the whole last third of the book. What kinds of deals and compromises does an old radical make when he gets inside of power or a little bit inside of power and wants to get even closer inside of power within that Republican Party? Douglas is the prototype for this phenomenon that we've seen so much of in our own lifetimes. Think of Nelson Mandela. I mean, Douglas didn't spend 27 years in prison, but he had 20 years in slavery. Think of John Lewis and a host of other civil rights leaders who got elected mayors and congressmen and senators. And then for God's sake, that younger guy, that community organizer from Chicago, you know, when he, and we all hyped at him, you know, he wasn't going far enough on this, and he, was, and he wasn't a radical. Eh, he had a radical past, but he was president of the United States, for God's sake, and we kept wanting him to be something else, some of us. That's a misuse of the we, sorry. We're all using a we out here in Martha's Vineyard, too loosely, probably. <laughs> a fifth big theme is a theme in all good biography, but in Douglas's case, it's a really complicated mess, and that is how do you find the balance between the public and the private life? And in Douglas's case, it entails uh, analysis, uh, storytelling about that family, his wife Anna. And I've never been thrilled with this book. I've, been, I've, I've, been, I've had more than my share of good luck with this book. But I'm never thrilled as much as when somebody tells me, as the gentleman did yesterday at the other session, that he thought I, handled, that I humanized Anna Murray Douglas in ways he'd never seen before. Douglas's first wife of 44 years remained illiterate all of her life. There are no letters by Anna. There is nothing in Anna's voice. You have to get at Anna by other sources, other ways, side doors, what people said about her, what three of her own children wrote about her in extraordinary little reminiscences, two of which 
are in the, the Evans collection in Savannah and nowhere else. When I found those, it was like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> it was like, please, I couldn't make this up. Um, but that, uh, that private life is hidden by Douglas himself, and you've got to get to it by other means and other ways, including relationships with two very important European women in his life, Julia Griffiths in the early 1850s, English woman who spent six years in Rochester as Douglas's assistant editor on his newspaper, his principal fundraiser, his closest dear friend, uh, his editor of his own prose, uh, his confidant, uh, possibly more but not likely. And then a woman named Otilia Ossing, a German woman with whom Douglas had a friendship relationship on, off, for probably 23 years. Read the book on that one, unless you want to ask about it in Q&A. Teaser. And last but not least, there's the big theme, especially ever since he becomes a public man in his 20s, of Douglas the thinker, the artist, the intellectual, his thought which is now a big subject for scholars. There's no less than three books by political theorists on Douglass's political theory, which is mostly about his use of the natural rights tradition. There are no less than two major collections of essays on Douglass by law school professors, all about Douglass's constitutionalism. And there have been for years, Skip's left now so I can say something about the literary critics, but for years literary critics have been studying Douglass upside, up one side and down the other. It uh, used to be a rite of passage in black literary criticism that you had to write your essay in chapter one of Douglass's narrative. They've now stopped doing that. They've moved on to others. But Douglass has been the subject now of very serious study of his ideas for decades. And that's the way it should be. And there's a good deal in the book about that. I'll just end with this. I mean, I've had an amazing year with this. The most heartening thing about it is to realize how many Americans, and I'm not a Pollyanna about any of this, but how many Americans out there really do want to read books, history, biography, who are yearning for stories that might actually have some moral core to it, who are yearning for ideas from another time, doesn't matter what time, that might buoy us now, that might feel us Feel, help us feel our feet on the ground that might give us some possible faith in our institutions. Frederick Douglass is the prose poet of American democracy. I don't think we've ever had a better one. He's certainly the prose poet of American democracy in the 19th century. He lives in the middle of his life, this greatest transformation the United States has ever had, from slavery to the coming of the Civil War, the fighting of that Armageddon, the transformation of the emancipation of four million people, reconstruction and this reinvention of a second American republic. And then he lives long enough to see it being eroded, defeated, torn apart. And he had more to say about the meaning of all that than perhaps any other American of his century. And he said it so often in prose that it's just unforgettable. We tend to remember Douglas, as I said, in his words, the last sentence of his second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, which is his long-form masterpiece. People tend to read the first narrative because it's so short. That's good. It's good for teaching. <laughs> but Bondage and Freedom is a masterpiece. It's 440 pages. It's a much more political autobiography. You can see Douglas in this autobiography in the middle of the 1850s shouldering up to the possible uses of violence. You can see him as a political animal now. He's concerned and arguing about the nature of power now, not just moral suasion. And of course, he's telling more of his life. But when he ends it, he ends by saying, first he ends by saying, I will never forget the humble origins from which I came. That's a good move. It's the sympathy of your reader. And then he says, as long as heaven allows me to do this work, I will do it with my voice, my pen, and my vote. <laughs>
My voice, my pen, my vote. My voice, my pen, my vote. Now, from 1841, when he first enters the public stage as a, an abolitionist, to 1877, when Rutherford Hayes appointed him Marshal of the District of Columbia and he got his first federal appointment, the first salary in his life, from 41 to 77, Douglas never made a dime except with his voice and his pen. And he didn't make enough dimes. He could barely feed his family in the early 1850s. Julia Griffiths bought the mortgage on their house so they could keep it. I always tell my students, being an abolitionist, not a good career move. <laughs> Never going to be upwardly mobile. No ranks, you know, you can traverse through like academia. You might get killed. My voice, my pen, my vote. And frankly, it's all any of us have now. Unless you have fabulous wealth and can influence power, all you have is a voice, a pen, and a vote, and most of us don't have a pen. But we're here to celebrate the pen. Thank you. We got two microphones, and I welcome your comments and questions. We got a good 10 minutes or more, or, or not quite 10. OK, go ahead, sir. A marvelous book with which I spent the summer. But you didn't mention Helen Pitts. OK. Was that a demonstration project or a personal issue? Demonstration by him? Yeah. No, it wasn't a de demonstration. Helen Pitts is Douglas's second wife. I, only, I didn't mention it only because I don't have time. Uh, Helen Pitt's a fascinating woman. Uh, Anna, his first wife, dies in 1882 after several strokes. A extremely important but difficult marriage for years. Um, he married Helen a year and a half later. Helen was a Mount Holyoke graduate who grew up in an abolitionist family from western New York State. She had solid abolitionist credentials, to say the least. She had worked in a contraband camp in Washington, D.C. during the Civil War as a missionary and a teacher and a nurse. She caught malaria there. Uh, she moved to Washington in the uh, late 1870s. Douglas hired her as one of the eight clerks in the Recorder of Deeds office when he became Recorder of Deeds. I'll just tell you one quick story about that. On the day he and Helen decided to get married in total secrecy, this is the most famous black man in the world marrying a white woman. They did not even tell his children, adult children now. And his daughter Rosetta was a, a, almost exactly the same age as Helen. Helen was uh, 46 and he was 66. On the day they got married, Rosetta, who also worked in the Recorder of Deeds office, his first four appointments were his four children and he got accused of nepotism all over the press, which was true. Rosette is sitting at her desk, and a reporter comes in and says, uh, do you realize your father just bought a marriage license down the hall today? This was in City Hall. And Rosetta probably said, what? <laughs> Within an hour, it was out. They got married privately in the parlor of Francis Grimke, a young black minister, a close friend of Douglas's. They had decided, apparently, well, it's quite clear they had decided, take the blow back afterward, not before. It was the most scandalous marriage of the 19th century. I can't think of any other one that ever got this. It went on for months in the press, white press, black press. And they handled it with incredible grace, to be frank about it. He just said over and over and over and over, I'll marry who I wish. Thank you very much. And by all accounts, the last 11 years of his life, it was a great marriage. She became the intellectual wife that he'd never had which is not in any way to denigrate Anna. Uh, Helen Pitts was very well read, very well educated, and she traveled with him. She went, every, she went most places with him. Anna had never traveled with him. And they will even do an 11-month incredible European uh, Mediterranean tour uh, in 1886 and 87. Uh, Helen, Douglas's adult children, though, I have to say, never really warmed up to Helen. There's a very modern story there about a 
stepmother that they didn't appreciate. Uh, thank you for the question, sir. Yes, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of finding your online lecture course, mm. uh, which was terrific. And I just wondered, not necessarily with respect to Douglas, although it could be, uh, whether uh, there are major ways in which you teach the course differently today. Than yeah, they taped that recorded. baby about nine years ago or something. Yeah, things change. Politics changes. My jokes change. And <laughs> so I wish they'd videotape it again. I got, I got some jibes in there, George W. Bush, that don't make any sense now. I mean, uh, and uh, new research, by God. In fact, I quote Tony Horowitz's book on John Brown now, which came out right after that, uh, Midnight Rising, which is one of Tony's greatest books. It's his straight-ahead history. Uh, I quote from that book at length in, in one of my lectures. So, yeah, they're different. So come on down to New Haven sometime. And sit. it's 1030, Tuesday and Thursday morning in the winter semester, spring semester. Sir. I, um Professor, I read your book. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to. That killed a lot of your weekends. It's, it, you know, it's well <laughs> worth it. And I love the transformation of Douglas all the way through. And it's close to being arrested, as you talked about the John Brown days. Yeah. But what interested me most in what you covered was his idea on reparations. Yeah. Which was really, and you may want to elaborate on this, was an affirmative action idea. So why don't you kind of go with that, I think. Okay, Douglas did, without actually using the word reparation, at various times, suggest <laughs> that the United States government, since it had fought a massive war and sacrificed thousands to free black people, now had a responsibility to civil and political rights, to security and protection, to education. Now, is that reparation? Or is that just historical responsibility? Is that just good lawmaking? I mean, you can call it whatever you want. People have dipped back into Douglas and dipped back into a lot. There was an actual reparation movement of a sort in the 1880s and 1890s, led by an African-American woman named Callie House. Um, there's a good book on her. She actually led a campaign that would have the, the, federal, well, the, the idea was the federal government would give X amount of dollars to every former slave and their family. Now, this made perfect sense in the 1880s. You got millions of former slaves who are still alive, and now they're sons and daughters and descendants. These are the actual people, you know, as opposed to now we always end up debating who's a real descendant and so on and so on and so forth. But Douglas's notions about reparations or repair had to do with the just basic vision and responsibility that he saw at the core of Reconstruction. If you're going to remake the republic around the idea of, of a new vision of equality, and it's going to be racial equality, now you have to have federal enforcement of that. And some of my favorite parts of Douglass's political language are when he just attacks the tradition of states' rights. We live again in an age of states' rights. We've got a states' rights Supreme Court. We've got a states' rights president, whether he even knows he is or not. Um, Douglas, and how could you not, if you were uh, at the core of the Republican Party in the middle of the Civil War, believed in energetic activist federal power? Now, whether that resulted in amounts of money given to people, or simply more safety, more security, more protection, more education, and so on and so forth. If you press Douglas to the wall around the late 1880s, he might have said, why don't we just create much better schools? Why don't we crush the, the Klan and its descendants once and forever? Why don't we crush this lynching phenomenon? by the use of federal authority, but by then, of course, there are no federal troops anywhere to resist the lynching epidemic that broke out around 1890. Douglas, you need to remember, lives all the way to the peak years of lynching. I mean, lynching goes on way into the 20th century, but the biggest years of lynching were about 1892, 93, 94, 95, the last four years of his life. And the last great speech of Douglas's life, called Lessons of the Hour, which he first wrote in 1893, and he's giving it dozens and dozens of time, times down to the last three or four months of his life. He's 76 and 77 years old, and he's traveling all over the Midwest, 
It's a speech that analyzes why the Negro is lynched. In fact, sometimes that's the title it went by. And it's, it's one of the, it, it still holds up as a kind of really careful analysis of why black people were being lynched. Uh, so uh, protection, security, more education. He never called it reparations. They're going to put the hook in us here. Uh, no? You mentioned you mentioned that Douglas had several dysfunctional that <laughs> several children, and you said something about dysfunctionality. Uh, did one of them was one of them named Haley? Um, no, not by first name. There, there's a grandson named Haley. Oh, that can't are, be. Are you a descendant? No, <laughs> no. I'll relieve you of that right now. But I. I did go to a high school, mm -hmm. and I'm a very old woman, where one of the faculty was named Haley Douglas. Yeah. And people said he was Frederick Douglass's son. I bet it was a grandson, or even a great-grandson. There are a lot of Douglas descendants. Uh, there were 21 grandchildren. However, half of them died in infancy or by their teenage years. Douglas and his wife Anna were always doing funerals. That's part of the problems in that family. By dysfunction, I meant that his sons in particular had a devil of a time getting jobs, keeping jobs, making a living, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and became very dependent on their father. There's a wide variety of Douglas descendants. Uh, I know uh, quite a few of them. Um, there was a Haley who was a grandson. N okay. None, Thank you. He had no son named Haley. If there was a son named Haley, I'd like to know about it. Uh, <laughs> and so would a whole bunch of other Douglas scholars. <laughs> Thank you.